All the boys are kind of that's basically. That's all. Yeah. I'm not going to be a pull up, I will call uh, this meeting to order. We acknowledge with gratitude that we live and work on the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish Nation, whose people have been stewards of these lands and waters surrounding the Kualahem Bowen Island. Uh, welcome to the Bowen Island Municipality Committee of the whole meeting for November 16, 2022. Uh, and thank you for joining. I am Andrew Leonard, the Mayor of Bowen Island Municipality and Chair of this meeting. Um, I'd like to open our meeting just by introducing the other elected official, uh, elected members of Bowen Island Islands Council here this evening. Uh, to my left, we have Councillor Tim Wake. Uh, to his right, Councillor Allison Morse. Councillor Judy Getty just into the room. Always welcome. Uh, to our right, uh, Councillor Swillen Fast. And members of our professional staff will be contributing uh, to this uh, meeting as well. Our Chief Administrative Officer, uh, Liam Edwards, Councillor to order, please. And uh, to my uh, right, our corporate officer, Sophie Insignia. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and when members of the public speak during the public comment and question and answer portions of the meeting, your presence and voice will be included in the permanent recording, which will be available at bowenislandmunicipality.ca and on our YouTube channel, uh, as I see it uh, being streamed now. Before seeking to adopt the agenda for uh, this afternoon, I'd like to make a few comments on meeting procedure. So just uh, as always, to keep an orderly flow uh, of discussion and debate, uh, members of the assembly, please seek to be recognized. And for those watching here online, um, uh, because this is the first time we do have councillors online, uh, Councillor Saunders and Councillor Jurgensen, if you do, uh, if you would like to be recognized, just raise your virtual hand on Zoom and uh, the corporate officer will let us know. That said, uh, I will look please, for uh, an adoption of the agenda. So moved by uh, Councillor Waite, seconded by Councillor Fast. Any objections? The agenda is adopted. Do we have any uh, public comments for this evening? Um, we do, we have one. One uh, from Gail Lautenberg. Uh, so, Gail, I would invite you to, um, do we have space for uh, uh, Ms. Lutton? I could, I could just stand. Maybe come up beside Drew here. Thanks, Gail. I, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Gail Lotenberg, and I'm with the board of the Hearth, and I am the chair of the public, the Performance Arts Center subcommittee of the Hearth, and I thought it would just be nice to be able to put a face to the name since we've been actively uh, engaged in questions around how the performance space in the community center will be developed and to make sure that it is a uh, well-functioning and adaptive space for live performance. It's a critical issue. The entire community center project began with the advocacy of people in our performance arts community trying to create a viable space for performing arts on Bowen Island. Thank you. So that's me. Thank you. Thank oh, you. and I wanted to acknowledge that John Siddell, who's also on our subcommittee, is seem to have um, come on through the virtual attendance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending too, John. Thank you. That concludes the public comment portion of uh, this meeting. Uh, moving on in the agenda, item 3.1 in staff reports, briefing on the community center project for new council um, by our uh, manager of recreation, Julian. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say that as we start, um, that this will be very much a team effort, this presentation. And uh, when speaking about it, I know Liam and I would like to give the project team a chance to introduce themselves before we get into the presentation. We can start it. Oh. <laughs> the project team. We are the project team. I'm Drew <laughs> Rose. I'm Nick um, Young. My firm is called Still Point Architecture, and together with my Colleen Craig, who is from the Municipal Principal Architecture, we got together uh, to pursue the community center project here on the street. We'll back to 2016. Thank you for being here. Craig Burns, Principal Architecture. Um, and we do represent a much larger team that um, was working on the project. But, um, I don't think this is the time to go through all of those. Thank you. Right. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Mask. Um, I have been working on this project for a 
many decades now. I think I was maybe 20 when I started. At any rate, um, <laughs> I'm uh, in my former role as the executive of the Rhode Arts Council, part of um, the Big Work Schools Project, and currently working with the municipality and the foundation. Hi, my name is Shelley Sainsbury. Um, I am a consultant or with uh, 3EP Consulting. I'm a fundraising consultant, and I've been brought on to help with uh, securing uh, the larger gifts that will allow this um, project to get to its final completion on the fundraising side. On the fundraising side. And if we could go to Sam or Evening, everyone. Afternoon. Thank you so much for. Uh, letting me introduce myself. My name is Sam Collins. I'm uh, a consultant project manager working on this project since 2016 with all the lovely people on Bowen Island. Thank you. I think what we will do, we can start the presentation. We do welcome questions throughout. Please, you don't need to wait to the end to ask a question. Um, we may you know, defer something if we know that it will be addressed a little bit later in the presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Liam to take us through the start of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Jillian. Um, so uh, if we can move to the next slide. So I just want to talk briefly about the, um, the content of the, uh, the meeting. So um, we'll do an overview, a bit of a history of the project, how we got to where we currently are today, um, design process. We're not seeing it yet. Oh, it's not up on the. Oh, I'm sorry. And I'll just take this moment to remind those of us sitting here that we need to speak quite loudly in order for the public to hear it through Zoom. Okay. I can try to share my okay, screen. Do you want to know why it's not working? It was, it, it was shared online a moment ago. A little uh, back to my last there. It's there, Sophie. Some of us online, I gather, but not here in the room. I can see it online. We're just trying to get it presented on the big screen here for folks to see. So bear with us. <laughs> Turn this little monitor around. I could quickly print copies of it if that would We've all got them on our lap. So well, some of us didn't bring our equipment because we thought it would be up here be me. Yeah, I think we um maybe we, we can we can even turn the monitor around to the side. I have it on my on my screen and I think uh Council Lake and Council Morris have it on their screen. So, uh, Okay. There we go. Fantastic. Well done, Sophie. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Over to you, Ms. Drake. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so we'll do uh, an overview of the project. Um, we talked a little bit about the project team already, a bit of a history, how we got to where we are today. 
um, we'll, we'll do a bit of a review of the design process, uh, how we ended up with the design that we're, we're currently building. Um, and then we'll talk about the construction that's ongoing right now. Um, and, and we'll look at the budget and uh, financial implications of the, of the project as, as we're in it. Um, so um, the, the project is, we call it, and um, I think it was a, a lot of discussions about different naming uh, uh, ideas around the project, but effectively it's been landed on as like our island place. And really it is about having a central meeting place uh, that is for the community. And um, it's a real, really a purpose-built community asset. And I, I must admit that when I moved to Bowen in 2020, I was really surprised. I, I knew about the project um, in part because there was funding that was coming from where I used to work. Um, and uh, but I, I didn't know that there was no other community center. I, and, and I knew that that was part of the application. There's a strong part of the application that there was no other community center. But I, I kind of thought that there would have been some other type of community center. And so I was really surprised to realize that there's no actual community center here whatsoever. Having lived on numerous other islands on the coast, um, you know, every place where I've lived, has always had at least one community center, if not several. And so um, the, the idea of having a central hub where a community can gather for activities or even just informally is, I think, critical to the health and well-being of any community. Um, the idea that the project is also an economic stimulus for the community as well in that it will certainly create jobs during the construction process, but it will also support the community from an economic perspective throughout its life and, and enabling opportunities for performances and for uh, programming, for staffing those programming, and and um, and perhaps we'll get a coffee, little coffee shop in there one day, and we'll have other sorts of economic benefits like that from, from, the, uh, from the project. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jillian if there was more that we wanted to talk about on the project team side of things, or, or, or whether uh, the introductions that we've done is, is. I think the introduction will suffice. We just wanted to make sure that uh, people are realizing that it's it's been a very dedicated team for many years working on this project mm -hmm. together. Right. Um, and I believe I'm handing over to uh, Jackie. Thank you. So uh, as noted on this slide, um, I'm going to just give a quick glance at the project's history, um, touch on the extensive community engagement that has ensued, and briefly give some background on how the concept and development process unfolded. I won't be speaking specifically to that, only that is the design team, just to give you a sense of a framework around um, how that emerged. So um, yeah, I, I think I'll start just by reading this slide in case can't see it. Um, our vision, we started with a vision, which is uh, for the community center an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable facility that is truly of, for, and by the community. It is the heart of the community, a place where islanders can gather, share, and participate in activities and events that build and celebrate a healthy and resilient community. So the community center will invigorate our community through exploration of and participation in cultural and recreational activities, it will help us stretch our understanding and perceptions of who we are as a community and also how we work, play, and live together on our island. And uh, we, we adopted our branding promises. We are better for being here through um, establishing this center. So I just want to add that this roots, as you've already heard, has very, or this project has very deep roots. Um, even before we became a municipality, we dreamed of this place where islanders could gather and as Liam has referenced, Bowen had this infamous um, reputation of being one of the very few communities in all of Canada with lacking a community hall or any um, dedicated, publicly owned dedicated space for the community. Yet we know that um, community spaces play a role in nurturing a sense of identity and connection that belonging to a place and it can help foster social cohesion for everyone in the community from children to seniors. So the community centers often offer also the first point of contact 
um, for arrival of newcomers. And um, as through the programs and services that they provide, they build health, uh, wellness, and increase quality of life. Go to the next slide, please. So this slide we titled the versatile and vibrant hive, and we have three images, and I'm just going to describe them a little bit. Um, they reflect some of the activities that would take place in our new facility. This includes on the far left, a picture of a young girl who's very focused on painting a wooden bird box very brightly. Um, and the middle image is of some uh, really captive looking women <laughs> preparing for a fitness class. It looks like yoga is the featured activity. The third picture portrays a public presentation by indigenous artists, including a drummer, as well as some children in traditional clothing. So this community center is envisioned, again, as Liam mentioned, as a hive of activity for our community, located in the heart of our island and near key amenities, including our local school and seniors housing. It will feature much needed flexible and multi-use spaces to enable expansion of recreational arts and community programming. So it will, improve, it will improve access, provide essential spaces for all Islanders from the youngest to the eldest, for the most engaged to those who feel marginalized within our community, as, and including as pictured here in the local First Nations community. It will become an integral part of our island life serving all who come through its doors and attracting newcomers who recognize the value of a socially and culturally rich community. We could go to the next slide, please. So then this slide delves in a little more into the history of the Community Center Project. So on the left is a list of nine comprehensive resorts, including functional and programming studies that were undertaken between 2005 and 2017. Uh, as this attests over the years, BIM has engaged with stakeholders to identify the priorities and needs of all islanders. So time after time, the main challenges were identified as a complete lack of or inappropriate spaces for programming needs, increased demand for recreational and cultural programming, which cannot be met due to unavailability of space, a complete lack of large indoor space during the week, a limited access to or limited availability of spaces that are owned and used by other organizations whose own programming takes priority. So for example, the Legion, Collins Hall, Kate's Hill Chapel. And finally, inadequate venues for presenting performing arts, which um, Dale mentioned as well. So the design and functional program of the community center builds on this rich foundation of numerous studies, reports, and public engagement. Uh, the right-hand panel, I'm just going to read through that as well, for those who can't see it. So since 2015, the uh, BIM Council, Council has designated the Community Center Project a priority within its strategic plan. Both the Community Recreation Plan and the Cultural Master Plan, which is Bylaw 446, identify the Community Center as the top priority for the community. This was an outcome of the research surveys and interviews conducted to inform and develop those two plans. BIM has partnered, again, as Gail mentioned, with the HEARTH, Arts on Bowen, um, the Bowen Island Arts Council, signing a, a memorandum of understanding to build a public amenity, collaborating on the design, community engagement, and fundraising campaign. So in 2016, the uh, council convened the Bowen Island Community Center Select Standing Committee, and uh, shortly thereafter hired a project manager, OESP, and selecting a design team with members from principal architect and still point architecture. If you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I just want to talk a little bit about stakeholder engagement. Um, this slide on the left has a colorful uh, board set up outdoors for the public to view and ask questions on a one-to-one -one basis. It lists the many ways the project team, uh, on the right, it lists many ways the project team has engaged with the public over the years and throughout all phases of the project. Uh, BIM has relied on an array of communications vehicles, it has held numerous open houses, including five, focusing on the referendum in 2020 at various venues and virtually online. We've organized workshops, uh, such as the one with members of the performing arts community and professional theater, acoustic, and, and um, lighting consultants to ensure that needs were being met and the facility would be as highly functional as possible. We've tailored presentations to groups and everyone interested, including 
uh, we've looked at the Bowen Island Legion, Community Foundation, Rotary Club, Theater on the Isle, Children's Center, Seniors Keeping Young. I believe we presented the Economic Development Committee, maybe archives. We rode the Queen of Capilano uh, to engage people as they came to and from the island. And we organized booths at the community events, everything from BoFest Canada Day celebrations. Um, and I say we, this was a joint um, effort between the uh, municipality as well as the hearth. And uh, we also reached out to the Squamish Nation, local schools, and our federal and provincial representatives, government representatives. Um, BIM established a dedicated website for the community center in August of 2017 and continues to circulate e blasts and newsletters, articles in the undercurrent, all island mails, posts in both BIM and the hearth again, regularly post updates on their website and on social media. I would now like to pass us over to the design team. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Um, so yeah, in 2016, um, Craig, uh, his firm, and I were sharing office space in Vancouver, and the project, um, the Community Center project, came to our attention um, primarily through an RFP, a request for a proposal, um, which was actually, I believe, initiated by Sam as a project manager representing the municipality. Um, that RFP was really um, uh, strongly responded to. There were over 20 architecture firms who came to the, the mandatory site meeting and, and put in proposals. Proposals look kind of like this, they're a little book. Um, and the pro proposal is for fees, um, it's for services, um, and it includes the whole team that we're proposing to use throughout the project. Uh, so it's it's kind of a big deal to put it together. And it's certainly, as Craig alluded to, it's not just us. There's a whole team of people who are working with us on the project uh, who form the, uh, the design team. So um, this kid was so early 2017, we, um, we were fortunate enough to be shortlisted and there was an interview process and we were successful in being awarded the project. Um, so early 2017 now, we are the team and we're moving forward. Now, first things we started to look at as we do, the constraints and the opportunities that are related to this project. Um, and there are a number of constraints. Um, the first one that came to us that we realized was the site that we've been given was actually not that large. It was part of a, a larger parcel, but it was a relatively constrained site, um, for example. Um, and um, we're also looking at the school adjacency and the relationship to the code and things like that. And, and how was our design going to respond to some of those some of those constraints? And perhaps the most challenging of all was the program. In our role, the program has nothing to do with computers. It's a list of rooms, spaces, and what occurs in them, the size of those things and their interrelationship. So um, the, the, I think Craig will speak more to this, but the program had been reduced from uh, the original program, which was developed in 2008. So it's a much smaller building. Um, having gone through that process, we and we have this design team, and they were have been working with us you know, all along the way. So that team includes structural, mechanical, electrical engineers, civil engineer looking at all the site work, um, landscape architects. We have a full-time theater consultant who we've been consulting with and meeting with the uh, performing arts groups on the on the island with that particular consultant, um, as well as an acoustic consultant to ensure that um, the sound quality within the spaces is good. Um, and our sound um, our acoustic consultant is also a, a sound expert, so we've been dealing with PA systems and things like that. Um, the municipality, um, those consultants were retained directly by us. The municipality also retained uh, a cost consultant, a quantity surveyor who's been working with us all through the project. Uh, they retained the, uh, the uh, geotechnical engineer and the surveyors. So, um, and the design has developed and evolved as it does. We, we see the evolution of the design process as going through a series of quite discrete phases. There's a schematic design phase, Often that's primarily our work, but pretty quickly the other consultants are starting to give us feedback into that into that 
process. The next stage is design development. And then we're going into the more technical work, the, the uh, construction documents, the documents we use for building permit and to go to construction, detailed uh, architectural structure, mechanical, all of the drawings from all the consultants and a specification, which as a book is a huge book telling um, bidders how to uh, how, how all the materials in the project are to be installed, what they are, and so on. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a highly complex um, kind of process. And this is all uh, done in preparation for going to a public tender, um, which we did. And the contract was awarded in early 2022. And as you know, the project is ongoing. I'm going to give it over to Craig, and he's going to talk a little bit more about that as a process. Um, yeah, the, the design process uh, went on for quite some time. And so we thought it would be helpful to kind of walk through that process and um, highlight some of the points in the process where things changed direction or um, got more detailed or, or were changed altogether. Um, like was mentioned before, the project actually started uh, based on a feasibility study by an architect in 2008. Um, and at that point, a uh, community center was identified as a, all the ingredients added up to, uh, I think, a 30,000 square foot building. And so the premise when we became involved was that it was all the same program elements, but literally half the size. And so, um, the vision was to create a more modest size building, but to still maintain uh, an aspirational goal to include a lot of multifunctional program space. Uh, so the design process started, as Drew mentioned, uh, in terms of validating the program. And so the program is a breakdown of all the different spaces in the project. And what we did was consult with um, municipal staff, uh, other stakeholders from the arts community and rec community in order to validate that program and understand how it might need to change in order to accommodate all the needs. Um, and so that validation process, uh, the goal was to gather a, a number of the program spaces that are around the island under one roof. And uh, it meant that the original program that we started with began to grow in area. And so it was through that process of consultation that uh, the starting area for the building began to incrementally increase in order to accommodate those needs. Uh, it is worth noting that the program always included the main building components that are in the current design. So a large and a small multi-purpose room uh, a living room or gathering space, uh, a rec weight room and classroom, and uh, the municipal offices. Some key decisions were made early in the process to maximize community accessibility and to reduce cost. And those were related to the, how the building was gonna be constructed. So a wood frame building, a single story building, a uh, slab and grade building, um, and access directly from Bowen Trunk Road. Those were priorities in order to make this uh, sort of universally accessible community spot. The other ambition for designing the building was to ensure that the spaces that were allocated were multifunctional spaces. Uh, they weren't uh, necessarily dedicated to one specific program and would sit empty. The idea was that uh, a variety of programs that are being offered on the island would be able to be accommodated. Uh, the building design, as Jackie mentioned, was uh, presented, reviewed, uh, and approved on several occasions during the design phase, um, presented to the steering committee, uh, to council, in public open house event, and, uh, and some other public events like, like Bullfest and, and Town of the Day. And again, as Jackie mentioned, sorry, I didn't have a copy of Jackie's notes. Um, the website actually became a place where a lot of the design decisions were documented uh, throughout this design process, including um, some 
some really important frequently asked questions that were um, hot topics in the community. And so there was some attention paid to respond to those questions, even if those design elements weren't able to be incorporated into the project. Um, there was a very clear rationale that was presented on uh, dedicated website, rilandplace.com. Uh, and so that was a, a key communication point. Several design changes were made throughout the design process. And those design changes reflected the feedback that we had received from the various uh, user groups. And the intention was to accommodate those requests as much as possible uh, without expanding the scope of the project unless absolutely necessary. So again, um, if you look in documentation, there's an incremental growth of the building over time. Uh, but at, at each stage when that design change was made, it was based on a, a very specific need that we heard as part of the design process. Uh, construction cost estimates were provided by a professional quantity surveyor hired by the municipality at various points uh, in the design process. And a funding application was made for a federal infrastructure grant. And uh, this application had an impact on the project schedule. Uh, it delayed some of our progress, uh, but the successful application has provided the largest portion of project funding to date. So worth it, I would say. One um, piece, if I can just add in there, Craig, um, related with the Investing in Canada infrastructure program and related to the team that was working on the project, and I'm sure you'll touch on this as well, is the addition of other team members um, brought to us because of the requirements for a climate risk analysis, which included some greenhouse gas studies and environmental conservation measures brought to the project. So that was uh, part of those delays were driven by gathering the requirements to get the funding needs from the federal infrastructure grant funding. Thank so you. Literally my next bullet point. <laughs> so additional design changes were made um, specifically as a result of the grant application and the requirements that came back um, as part of that uh, award. And so improvements were requested to maximize uh, accessibility. So that's um, in terms of uh, universally accessible spaces, gender neutral washrooms, um, all sorts of design features. Uh, those were incorporated as well as, uh, as Sam mentioned, energy efficiency measures and design for durability uh, in order to address the issue of climate resilience, which was key for that um, grant money. Uh, after that, the overall project was developed in much more detail with the entire consultant team um, and a coordinated set of documentation in order to describe all the different components of the project was developed uh, into a set of drawings and specifications, as, um, as Drew mentioned. And the original building permit that we had issued in November 2018 um, under the old building code was revised to include all of these design changes that addressed uh, grant funding requirements. And uh, that building permit was approved and issued in April of this year. And following that, uh, the final documentation was uh, consolidated and prepared uh, issued for public tender in June 2022. And so those are some of the highlights of where we went on the design process. I think Sam is now going to maybe talk more about once that documentation. Jillian is going to talk. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're going to talk about the program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. So I joined the project when I joined the municipality in November 2020, which is a very lucky time to come into a project and get to help implement this dream that the island has had. So this new building really will be a hive of activity. You can imagine if you walk in the front doors, 
Any Islander on a typical weekday can turn to the left and conduct business with the planning department or the administrative staff, or they can drop off their toddler at play care and take a class in the fitness studio. There's showers on site so people can take a fitness class and go directly to work or jump on the ferry. And we now finally have a space where we can offer specialized programs during the day for seniors and parents and tots, which is currently not an option at all for us. There are many meeting rooms, a number of meeting rooms in the building that can accommodate staff for council meetings during the day or evenings, but then can be used by groups such as the Bowen Island Conservancy or the Rotary Club or the Literacy Task Group at any time they can use these rooms as well. There's a beautiful courtyard at back, which really lends itself to activities such as spin or Pilates or yoga classes during the beautiful weather, or imagine a private elegance evening reception out there on the patio on a beautiful summer's night. So, the large multi-purpose room, as Craig mentioned, is a key component of the building, and it's designed to easily transform from general use into a high quality performing art space capable of accommodating a wide variety of live professional performances and community arts with groups such as Theatre on the Isle or our various community choirs. Notable features in this space include seating for an audience of 180 people, draperies and blackout blinds, high quality sound and lighting equipment and backstage rooms. And then imagine the performance is over, those 180 seats are retracted back, the drapes slide along the rails and to be tucked into a closet. And the room again is available for anything from a town hall meeting, dance class, carpet bowling, a book sale. So it's truly, truly multi purpose and multifunctional. At the north end of the building, it houses the key recreation based amenities, such as the weight room, the fitness studio, and the small multi purpose room. This small multi purpose room, we put a lot of thought into how it's really designed to accommodate a, a quite a variety of programming. Um, the, the storage is extensive, the flooring is very resilient, so it's really ready to host any number of messy programs and people. Imagine play care and art classes in this space especially. So prior to breaking ground, we reached out to Bob Baker, who's a cultural advisor with the Squamish Nation. And he's been involved with initiatives on Bowen Island for many, many years. He's, he's worked at, with this community school for Whale Day, and he's been present at many key events on our island over the years. So together, um, Splacklick and Spackwis Slolum, I apologize, Bob, if I mispronounced that. Uh, so Bob Baker and the Squamish Eagle Song Dancers, they came and led a very moving traditional land blessing ceremony on February 15th of this year, prior to the ground, to any groundbreaking. And they really grounded everybody who was present in a shared sense of respect for this land and for the immense value to the community that this new facility will bring to us. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Sam. Thanks, Jillian. <clears throat> I, I have to chuckle when I finish Craig's sentence after many years working together, I guess that's what happens. Um, <laughs> the tender process and some of the pieces which you've been hearing from the team already, um, the design team completed their issue for tender documentation in, in around May uh, 2021, where we uh, went to council to get approval to go to tender. The tender process began uh, through the BC bid website, a, a public tender platform that entities use to procure construction services and materials. Um, that process um, went to market. We had a series of bidders that came to a site walkthrough and a few of them that managed to respond with a fixed fee price, a CCDC2, a, a stipulated price contract um, style of tender process. And that process closed in August of 2021. What we found right away um, is that the market had been escalating hugely over the years. And unfortunately, we closed the tender higher than what we had budgeted for. And through a series of workshops and working with our um, team, we managed to go through 
um, value engineering and get a construction contract with a general contractor named Golden Globe Construction in um, the spring of 2022. That was a, a, a long process to get there. We're very, very glad to have a contractor working on island and um, working with us and worked with us to see that continual savings are developed or optimization of the construction process is developed. And as I'm sure the community and, and those around the table know and have seen as they've driven up trunk road, the construction is ongoing. Um, we are pouring concrete, we're doing earthworks, we're doing all the civil infrastructure to set the site ready for uh, the vertical infrastructure, the building itself. So in short order here, by, before the end of the year, we will see uh, the framing of the wood frame building start to be erected. Some of the benefits um, of the team we have, we have an on island local um, site superintendent. Um, that's great to see. We have various other on, on island resources, excavation, blasting, backfill, concrete, um, many of the team are, are local residents in the construction team. So the site's still in development, framing's about to begin, and ultimately we're looking towards having a, a project um, completed in the fall of 2023. Um, there are some challenges building on an island and the supply chain and the construction market, it is very busy uh, across the lower mainland, including getting uh, services, resources, and supplies um, to any construction project, especially one on an island. I think that sums it up me from me from a current state and construction process. And I believe, Liam, you're going to talk about budget. That's right. So as Sam um, alluded to, the 2018 um, Project cost estimate was about 14.4, maybe it was 14.5 million. Um, that was the, the detailed um, or as detailed of a cost estimate that the project had had at that point in time. And that's around the time that the project was submitted for funding application to the province through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. And, um, and through that infrastructure funding program, um, the project and the cost basically had to be held. And so once you submit an application, you don't get a chance to revisit your project costs and things like that. And so uh, those programs can take quite a bit of time to get a decision out of. And it wasn't until the um, summer of 2020 that a funding decision was made, uh, which was successful, which was fantastic. Um, it was and still is the largest single funding contribution to a community center project through that program. Um, and so it's, it's quite a remarkable contribution to any community for a community center project. That, that doesn't include like one off single uh, projects that might have occurred where, where maybe the city of Vancouver had brokered a deal or something like that. But through, through a competitive funding program, it was the single largest contribution. Um, and as Sam mentioned, through the bid process, we, we landed on the, the lowest uh, bid at 14.4, which was remarkable that that was our budget, but also very concerning. Um, and through significant co or, um, work and effort, we, we only managed to reduce the project by $400,000, but that was still uh, helpful. Um, and, and then we factor in the remaining soft costs and some of the owner supplied costs that are outside of the, uh, the uh, CCDC2 contract, as well as costs incurred to date. Uh, that brings us to a total updated project cost of 18.7 million. Um, Sorry, what is CCDC2? Oh, that's the um, uh, Canadian Construction dis uh, it's just Documents staff Committee. Contract. It's a standard contract format. There's a them. Thank you. I just and was saying all kinds of different things in my mind and it was distracting. <laughs> it's a fixed price. Thank you. Uh, um, and so the the process it was concerning because it represented that the project was 30% over budget. And however, 
it was also recognized that this was common throughout the industry. So the infrastructure environment was seeing these type of escalations and worse in some projects uh, in the lower mainland um, and throughout Canada. Um, I had noticed that the escalation was occurring even before coming to Bowen. And, and in part, it was, um, I, I just mentioned here on this slide that um, the medical center project also had a similar cost increase and it's for different reasons, but it, the primary uh, driver was that also it was delayed by a couple of years too. And so any project that had any delay was seeing significant impacts and um, and the, mostly those were impacts beyond the project owner's control and that the project owner would have to do whatever it could to manage and mitigate those costs. But essentially, if we move to the next slide, um, Sam touched on these before, but the primary drivers was infrastructure stimulus funding through the senior levels of government, supply chain disruption and labor market shortages, all pushing costs up. The infrastructure stimulus funding, which we so welcomed is also part of the problem of why costs were being driven up. Um, when I was still at the province, we were funding hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of infrastructure dollars uh, going out the door um, uh, quite rapidly in 2019 through 2020. And I remember having conversations with the federal government talking about the concerns of that, that the impact that that would have on the economy that we would revisit what happened in 2008 and 2009. Um, but it's, it's a cycle that we often find ourselves in when there's a, a bit of an economic slowdown, we'd like to do stimuli, stimulus, it generates a ton of activity, all of a sudden prices start to rise, things become out of reach, and then we find ourselves in a bit of an economic crunch. Uh, we're, we're seeing that here today dramatically, it's unfolding before us uh, as we speak and impacting every household. Um, then the pandemic hit and we saw a dramatic supply chain issues occur, which have really disrupted the uh, construction industry significantly. We're seeing uh, lead time requirements for some of the components of the project uh, exceed six months going into eight month uh, durations, if not longer. Um, so things like all of a sudden trying to get your hands on windows was going to take you six to eight months. Uh, if you And all of a sudden, the realization that there's only two significant window manufacturers in North America became uh, really concerning. We saw a labor market disruption in the lower mainland this year where the construction or the, sorry, the concrete um, supply industry went on strike and all of a sudden you couldn't get any concrete in, in Vancouver. Projects came to a ground and oh, we were lucky here on Bowen because we had Bowen concrete. Um, and Bowen Concrete was still doing business because they weren't part of that labor market issue. But they then started doing business in the lower mainland because they were getting uh, calls for, for doing uh, concrete where concrete was needed. So trying to get Bowen Concrete back onto Bowen was a challenge. And so all of these things uh, leading up into just significant cost crunches for, for any project. Um, and then certainly being on an island, just makes it that much more difficult. Uh, coordinating with ferries, uh, the lack of affordable housing, all of those things that you're very familiar with. So needless to say, we, we had a difficult decision before council and that was whether to advance the project with this type of a funding gap um, or, or not. And council made that tough decision. And I, I still believe today that it was a wise decision to still carry forward with uh, effectively $8 million in senior government funding. Um, that, that was uh, funding that would not be able to maintain or hold if the project uh, stopped or, or was tried to be re, uh, reconsidered. Um, so this slide here looks at a bar graph illustrating the various sources of funding for the project, starting with the largest contribution coming from the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program of almost $8 million. There's $1.2 million in coming from the COVID Restart Grant, which is a provincial grant. Um, 
that was the last program that I worked on at the province before I left the province to come to Poland. It was essentially an initiative that was a, a, a created by myself and my staff and then uh, supported through the Treasury Board. And, and it was the program that was designed to help support municipalities through the pandemic. And it effectively was uh, what's considered a um, unrestricted grant. And um, you know, we noticed in the design of this project that we had to revisit some key elements, including the HVAC of the facility, as well as some of the space considerations for the project in respect of what was happening with COVID. And so the use of this safe restart grant is, it's, uh, is a good fit with the, the redesign elements of this project. Uh, we also using $4 million in borrowing uh, through the referendum and an additional $1.2 million from municipal reserves. There's uh, approximately $1.3 million that has been pledged in donations uh, from the community so far to date. And that leaves us with the funding gap that we're currently trying to fill, which is around $3.1 million. And we're looking at uh, trying to secure 2 million of that gap through additional donations and, and, and pledges, and 1.1 uh, million through additional grants uh, through, through other programs. In particular, we've been looking at the Canadian Cultural Spaces Grant, and then I forget actually the name of another program that we're just looking at right now, it's just come up. Um, so in a nutshell, that is the, uh, the budget as it currently stands to date and how we um, are financing the project. And, and another key element of the project is uh, our operating plan. And like the original project design and project budgets, this was de initially developed several years ago and is in need of uh, refinement and updating which we're currently working on right now. So the entire facility will be owned and operated by Bowen Island Municipality, but it truly is a community facility and it's gonna be jointly uh, met. And it's the key element of the build, or I shouldn't say the key element, but one key element of the building is the large multi-purpose room. Um, and that will be jointly managed with a joint management committee. Um, but they'll also have influence and impact on the smaller multi-purpose room as well, if there's needs or opportunities for use of that room in the uh, arts and cultural uh, community. Um, so we've yet to establish that joint management committee. Um, it will be a partnership with the municipality and the hearth, and we may look to some other community members to be involved. And that joint management committee's role will really be looking at um, setting up policy and procedures for operating the facility, as well as scheduling the use of the facility and making sure that there's uh, equitable access to the various programming spaces. We know with certainty that operating this new facility will require some new additional staff that we don't have. This is a big facility, especially big for Bowen and, and big for our municipality. And so we're gonna need some expertise to help us. And it's likely going to need uh, full-time custodial support. So a person that's going to be able to help clean up after those messy kids in the day programs and those messy adults in the night programs. Um, somebody that will be able to help open up the facility in the morning and close it up at night. Perhaps throw salt down in the winter if it's icy and things like that. Um, we're also going to need somebody that's got some more expertise in managing a facility like this. And, and that can help with the ongoing maintenance and operations of this facility and, and can also help with the, the, uh, the scheduling and the, the programming of the facility itself. Um, so it's yet to be fully determined and, and nailed down, but we, we anticipate that there'll be about two full-time equivalent positions needed to help operate this facility. Costs for operating facility will be offset by rentals. And we are definitely uh, considering uh, what we would call like a sliding scale for rentals of the facility. So 
a community um, like group that was looking to get together to talk about underwater basket weaving, you know, would probably be paying the bare minimum. But if you're looking for a full on like rock, rocking all night long wedding party, you'd be probably paying top dollar. Uh, and we're, we're going to be looking at trying to maximize those revenue opportunities uh, through some of those higher, um, higher end rental opportunities. Um, and, but again, we're, you know, a lot of that is going to be determined as we move towards operating in, in the beginning and, and, and get a feel for how the, how the facility actually works. There is an endowment fund that is available to help offset operating costs. And that is an incredibly generous opportunity. It's a, a legacy fund that has been identified and, um, and, and it will be set up like a trust so we won't erode the actual uh, initial contribution. And, and that will really help offset operating costs too. As, as. So we hope to have that operating plan more nailed down and detailed and bringing to the council table um, in the new year. And so that we'll have, we can plan accordingly with uh, next year's budget. Next year's budget will really um, only be impacted uh, in a modest way because we don't anticipate the facility to be operating for very long in next year because we, we only anticipate it uh, to be operating in the, in the fall or winter of next year. So the true full operating costs and, and benefits of the facility won't be realized until 2020. And I think we're shifting now back to Jackie. Thank you. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about fundraising strategy. Um, so we developed a mix of revenues from donor solicitation, government grants, community fundra fundraising events and campaigns, again, which Liam has uh, referenced. So during our phase one, uh, we secured approximately 83% of the total budget of 18.7 million, and we attracted uh, just over 200 pledges totaling $1.29 million. This includes a $1 million anonymous donation. Uh, the Community Foundation has also received a legacy pledge of around $1 million for the project to be used for operating or other costs once the building is open. And as Leah mentioned, the Community Foundation also holds our endowment fund, um, which was established actually by the heart well over 10 years ago, and it will help offset uh, operating costs. Its market value right now is around $225,000. Uh, so as we move into phase two fundraising, we will be using a many-pronged approach to hit our target. This includes our ongoing seat sponsorship campaign. I've heard of that. Um, we've approximately now 24 seats have been claimed by community members. We are launching an end of, end of year giving campaign. We've submitted a grant to the Cultural Spaces Program of the Canadian Heritage mm -hmm. Department. And we uh, will look to other funding opportunities, including such the infrastructure grant, uh, or arts available to the Arts Council. And uh, we encourage you to keep an eye out for more community fundraising events and activities on the road. And again, just mentioning that endowment fund, we, our intention is certainly to build it to help with operating down the road. So to talk about a few other important components of our phase two funding, I'm going to hand you over to Shelley. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and so uh, after we did some review of the successes in those previous um, fundraising uh, campaigns uh, that Jackie mentioned, um, also looking at the fiscal targets, competing community funding needs, um, we developed a fundraising plan uh, and opportunities that we thought could provide the best possible position for the community center. I think um, what we what we heard early on was that the community at large was very invested in ensuring as much could possibly be uh, achieved in the overall community. So we didn't want to be one fundraising at the expense of the other. And that's the approach that we took when we uh, developed our plan for this fundraising campaign, uh, this phase two of it. Um, between uh, giving to the center and other capital projects across the island, it became really clear that the people of Bowen really cared deeply and were really willing to step up and uh, the community center being for the community, developed by the community, um, and it promises to become a hub and an important connector um, from opening day through to 
far into the future. And uh, Bowen Island holds a special place uh, for so many individuals, including multiple generations of their families. And we felt that an additional opportunity that we had was to develop um, legacy naming opportunities for individuals, families, corporations, and foundations. And as Zillian mentioned in her great walkthrough of the building, I think uh, you can see that there will be elements within that will be very meaningful to certain families and to certain individuals. There'll be something that really speaks to what they feel brings community out. And we want to make sure that we're leveraging that where we can. So on this slide here that you see up, um, this is showing you the floor plate of the um, community center and as well shows you uh, where each of the kind of spaces are, the multi-use. It's by no means uh, comprehensive. I'm sure we will find different uses for some of those buildings or so, some of those spaces, uh, but it does indeed tell you some relative size, space, and scale of opportunities. Um, with this, we've got 12 unique and we think um, meaningful legacy opportunities uh, for folks to participate in. They range from $75,000 through to uh, an opportunity to give well over a million and they would get to see their name on this center or in this center, depending on where they're giving. Um, while there are 12 opportunities there, the intent uh, is not that we will uh, have names on each of the 12. Um, the intent is that we would allow for opportunities for individuals who did find that this was the way they wanted to give. This is a strategy that's used um, throughout Vancouver, throughout North America, as a way to raise larger dollars from a smaller number of individuals. Now that by no means, um, discounts the importance and the meaningfulness of gifts of $20, $100, $1,000 um, in the 2500 for the seed campaign. Those are meaningful, important gifts. These are just a different type of gift for individuals who have a different availability of philanthropy. So this does go in line with what is happening in the Vancouver market in particular. That's where I tend to work. So that's the one that I've been able to compare against. Um, and, and we just think it's a really neat opportunity. Part of what we've been doing is speaking one-on-one -on -one with individuals within the community. Uh, some have already made a gift through that phase one portion. Uh, some are still considering a gift. Um, and we've asked them if this is something that they indeed uh, feel might uh, entice them or others in the community. And we've received very positive response to that. Um, so we uh, believe strongly that we will find the right members of the community who will indeed want to see their legacy um, on the Bowen Island Community Center. Um, and I'll just share that there are, uh, of course, uh, some considerations for naming uh, tenure, uh, ensuring that the, the name is aligned with all the uh, appropriate uh, community understandings and such. So um, those will be considered as well. <clears throat> so um, that brings us to the end of our presentation and, and there's much more to learn about this project. It's um, you know, a big endeavor for the community. It has uh, big implications for uh, financial implications for the community. It also has big implications for benefits uh, far and wide across the community. So, you know, I think we have touched on most of the key elements and um, you know, I want to open it up for questions, uh, but, you know, I also just want to, uh, before I do close off to sort of say this is, this project has a tremendous ability to help bring the community together in ways that we haven't really been able to before. And I think as a uh, council, um, you know, it's a, it's a, you'll be confronted with difficult choices around the center and around the project, but it's an opportunity also for, uh, for you to be out in the community and, and highlighting the benefits of it too. Thank you so much for the presentation.
um, and for all of you being here today and for the uh, uh, immense amount of work that's gone into the planning and the operational uh, considerations of this. Uh, and just coming here today to um, share that with the uh, with the new council. Um, and with that, I'd like to open it up to uh, council for uh, questions. So if you'd like to be recognized, just raise your hand. Uh, uh, the corporate officer will be monitoring the Zoom. I see John Saunders has his hand up. So uh, maybe I'll recognize John first, or Councillor Saunders first. Thank you, Mayor Leonard. Um, thanks for the presentation, everybody. That that was great. Um, I, I just I want to I got a comment and a question. The comment is that uh, the thirty percent increase over the past couple of years. I just want to note that I'm I'm do a lot of stuff in construction as well with large large projects across North America, and thirty percent is really good right now. If you're getting in under that, that's a, that's like a sell. It, it, it's like a win. So. Uh, not surprised to see that, and and it was inevitable. Um, the question I had is regarding the operating budget. I understand that it still needs to be fleshed out, obviously, and there's some months ahead to do that. But the the question is: is the intent for this uh, for this to run at a at a financial deficit and be dipping into the endowment to pay for anything, or more money from the municipality every month, or or is there an expectation that the rentals would hopefully cover uh, all that? all the administrative and resource, human resource costs and maintenance and all those other things. Edwards? Right, I think that's a great question, Councillor Saunders, I appreciate that. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll get great rentals and all sorts of keenness to reduce the uh, operating costs through that rental revenue. But in reality, I think it'll be a stretch to balance out the operating costs of the facility with the rental costs. Um, it'll definitely, we, we project that there will be a, a reduction, but it's probably, maybe it's too soon to say, but it's probably more like a 20% like a or 25% reduction. One of the um, things that we are looking at though is, is also, um, when we're looking at the operating costs, we're looking at, we're, by moving into this facility, we are reducing our current operating costs by renting this current facility and renting other facilities through the school and through the children's center. And I must make a, a shout out to the children's center for their flexibility in working with us and helping us deliver programs uh, through their facility and being flexible with us until we can get this facility up and running. Um, they've been really accommodating in that way. So we will see a reduction in some of our current operating costs, uh, but it won't be offsetting the, the new operating costs. Uh, so that will result in a increase to the municipal operating costs. Uh, but what we hope to then see is that that, that basically levels out and, um, and over time we're, we're hopeful that uh, we don't have to continuously be increasing uh, those, those costs. Thank you. Councilor Giddy? Um, the, um, the operating plan and the operating budget and the um, select steering committee. I would assume that that is work that's done by the select steering committee. Well, the, the actual operating plan and budget is done by staff and then brought to the committee for review. It'll also go to the finance advisory committee for their input prior to coming to council for. So one of the things that we did at the meeting the other day, um, Monday, um, was to uh, delay the appointment of councillors to the various committees. So um, because this is uh, important and ongoing, I'm just wondering if the select steering committee um, is one of the ones that's in need of having some sort of an interim appointment of um, council. That's something that possibly can't be answered now, but... Um, and that also goes for what the state of um, the terms of reference for the joint management committee and work that's happening on that. 
So uh, starting with the joint management committee that hasn't been initiated. Um, and so we've just been talking about it fairly loosely with our partners at the hearth. Um, and so we anticipate establishing that in the spring and then and developing the terms of reference and, and the like. We'd like to get that joint management committee up and running by the summer so that it's functional uh, before the facility is complete and operational. Um, regarding the uh, select steering committee, the project can probably, probably operate and carry forward with construction for a couple of months without the select steering committee. But if we wanted to advance the operating plan and get input from that committee and have council representation there, then um, a, an interim or direct appointment to that committee would be, uh, would be fine. Uh, and that's something that we could do uh, uh, prior to January, I think is when the uh, appointments were delayed. Um, with respect to fundraising, um, you've mentioned uh, individuals. Is there any um, objective in, ter in terms of corporate sponsors? I was going through the KMEEC um, activities for next month, and they've got a great long list of uh, fairly substantial corporate sponsors. So I think mean, I've heard that there's lots of businesses, but do business not go on be helpful? But is that part of the um, attack <laughs> or plan? Um, we are open to all suggestions. Uh, to date, not too many um, connections to corporate have been made by the folks that we have spoken to. And we have um, actively asked about a couple of companies that we thought might have um, business on, on Bowen, um, and we couldn't find a connection. So we are always uh, in the in the opportunities to have discussions if there are new names or new um, connections, new businesses that we should be talking to at any moment, we are available to do that. To date, I think there's only about three that have been brought forward as real prospects to talk to, and we're trying to set up meetings with those folks. Um, a very minor point, the, um, the sign that was up on the space uh, before construction started that has the picture of the hive and the amounts of money that have been raised and everything, that's sitting on its side um, facing the school ground, and it's kind of sad that that is how it's presented. I, I don't... Sam, maybe that's your purview. <laughs> um, you know, I think it, if it could be updated possibly with the other um, graph that you had earlier, something in terms of, you know, we are actively trying to fund them. So it's important. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Turn it around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Uh, kind of a specific uh, layout, uh, fight layout question. Uh, I'm just wondering what the plan or where you're at with parking, and um, also if there's been a, a traffic study done. Yes. Um, so there was a traffic study that was completed in 2016, I believe, and it looked at um, and and entrances and exits to the facility. And um, you know, so that really helped identify where the driveway access would be. Um, you know, being on the crest of the hill is a bit of a tricky place to enter and exit that facility. And so that there's been a lot of discussion about that and about um, whether there needs to be like a, uh, what they call like a slowdown, um, exit off of Trunk Road um, and or a takeoff um, uh, exit from the facility back onto Trunk Road. Um, so there's been a comprehensive assessment of that. Um, and, and the current design, I think, does the best it can at mitigating the, the risk of where the, the site is located. Um, parking was another impact to the cost escalation because of the, the constrained site that Drew Rose was talking about at the beginning. It, it made it difficult to achieve sufficient parking um, as per our own parking bylaw requirements. 
and, and, and imagining the amount of people that might be visiting the site. And so we worked with the school about like recognizing that we may have events where we want to use each other's parking. Um, and so we recognize that there's that sort of shared um, uh, use of each other's assets there, but we also then had to push north into the site, into the community lands to secure additional parking. Um, and so that's what we are calling like overflow parking. And like, we imagine that staff will mostly park there and keeping the parking that's up by the actual facility open for the, for the public. There. Uh, so that additional parking to the north, I believe, was um, designed to accommodate, I, I believe, 20, 26 or so vehicles, something like that. In totality, I think, I believe we have over 36 uh, parking <coughs> spaces, which is, meets our bylaw requirements. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Just a couple of questions from uh, my chair, just on the on the design piece. Are there any change requests currently in the hopper that are affecting um, scope, time, or cost in, in design at all? There's been multiple. Um, and so the first and largest was the parking. Yeah. Um, and, and then following and behind that was the need to do on-site septic. Um, and so that was uh, not originally contemplated when we ran into problems with the Snug Cove sewer treatment plant capacity. We recognized that um, this project wouldn't be able to connect to the sewer treatment plant. And so we needed to shift gears and allow for an on-site septic system. Um, and then there's been other um, change so there's been change uh, orders that have come in from the uh, vendor um, that I would say are, are um, more minor in nature. And then there's the change directives that have come from us, which are uh, really the two, the two big ones that I identified. Um, and one other one that is, uh, I believe it was a change directive was the relocation of our Heat, air source heat pump, which is how we'll heat the facility um, from the north end of the facility to the south end of the facility. Um, and that was uh, in part to try to realize some cost savings with the length of pipe run from where it was located to where the actual mechanical room is. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I, I'm gonna have to defer to Craig here for the details on, on the location. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Liam. I, I don't want to get into all of the detail, but there are um, several contemplated changes that are currently issued. Okay. And we're waiting for pricing back from the contractor on those. And um, like Liam said, some of them are extras, they're uh, additional costs. Some of them, like the air source heat pump relocation, is expected to be a credit, along with um, reducing the amount of suspended slab that's expected to be a credit as well. Um, but actually, we're waiting for pricing. So a number, virtually all of those changes haven't been um, captured in the construction contract until they are approved by the owner. Okay. And if I may add to that, to date, none of the changes have resulted in the vendor um, identifying that they would have impacted the delay on the project. So none of them are critical costs. I, I think some of them are, but they haven't, they haven't identified a delay um, Claim okay. for, for the work. I, I think there might be a handful of days that are included in the change orders that are out there right now. But okay. um, again, it's, it's it's probably more effective to go through that um, as a more detailed yeah. analysis rather than give you a big high level. Okay. Well, it's good to know that they're out there. Thank you. Um, and then just a, a question on on uh, fundraising. I, I love the comprehensive. Plan and it, it looks like there's been a lot of ongoing work on that. I'm just I'm curious whether the fundraising team has run into donor fatigue out in the community, just given the um, long nature of of the activities that have uh, that have gotten to uh, to the point of actual uh, building and what the impact might be. 
of that. I can take that one on. Um, we, ha we have heard from individuals that they are indeed supporting other initiatives. I would suggest that many of those individuals are also supporting things on the mainland and such. Um, so often it is just making sure that this project and this opportunity uh, is meaningful enough for them to consider it as well. So yes and yes. Like, so yes, yes, there is definitely uh, some amount of fatigue, um, but I think our opportunity here is to really showcase how amazing this will be for the community and inspire people to consider this as well. Okay. And I get the sense that the, the tax seems to be more towards major gifts instead of uh, multiple smaller gifts at this point. A little bit of both. We want to make sure everyone can participate. And so I think Jacqueline has done a great job of, of making really meaningful opportunities for individuals to give at all levels. Um, I think it's every gift over $200 will be recognized in some way, shape, or form at the new community center. So we want to make sure that everyone gets to participate. Um, but to get us to the number that we need, we, we do need to uh, have a bit more focus or a bit more uh, of a directed focus to the yeah. larger piece. Thank you. And uh, yeah, just let you know, folks, so I've had the opportunity to read uh, all of the minutes of the uh, community center committees and, and have seen the ongoing work with the design team, the recreation team, um, and the fundraising team, and the arts council, you know, now that part has, has done for that. So thank you uh, very much. Oh, Dr. Saunders on the Zoom screen in his car in Phoenix, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> we can tell, but at least I'm not driving it. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, j just one thing, and it doesn't need a long answer. I'm just, and I'm only asking this because it's my particular area of expertise, but um, has there been consideration during the design or in the construction phase for security of this building? Um, there's going to be some expensive equipment. There's going to be kids there, that kind of thing. Has there been a risk assessment done on on what uh, you know what kind of security might be worthwhile there? I don't know that uh, it's, it's Liam here. Um, I don't know that there's been an actual uh, risk assessment from a, a security to the physical infrastructure. Um, certainly during construction that that's always considered and there's adequate security measures in place during construction with uh, 24 seven video surveillance on the site. Um, yeah. But from, for, for, for the actual facility itself, I mean, beyond like the, um, the, the regular locking of doors and things like that, um, there has not been uh, any significant Maybe I can add two okay. things and pass it to Drew and Craig as well. <clears throat> they're, they're always through a design process, what's referred to as SEPTED or crime prevention through environmental design yeah. was taken into consideration during design as, as we looked at other facets of design like accessibility and these things. Uh, so security was considered as we have so many different program spaces, but there hasn't been a formal threat and risk assessment by a threat and uh, risk assessment professional um, performed on the operational environment. Okay. Um, yeah, and I guess one of the reasons, I'm pleased to hear there's been a SEPTED assessment done, so that's great. But um, one of the reasons I ask is that if, you, if there is a need at some point to be putting any kind of uh, electronic security in, and I think it'd be limited for this, but if there was, now's the time to be doing it, not after construction, because then you're you know, kind of having to do a lot of retro work, which isn't really useful to anyone. There's a few hands up in the room, Councillor Saunders. So uh, uh, Ms. Drake has a, a response as well. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. I'd like to add that um, as we've been working on the staffing forecast for the facility, that's definitely one of the things that we've been considering. Because I think in, in some earlier versions, it was considered, well, could it be left and volunteers shut, shut things out? Like, so no. We recognize that we do need to have staff on site when the building is open always. So that's one of them. Um, in terms of some of the equipment in the large multi-purpose room, the performing arts space, some of that equipment, sorry, is actually located up in the sound booth. And the sound booth, um, when the seats are retracted, it's not easily accessed. So um, if it's if it's currently 
if it's in a situation where it's set up for a performance and the seats are out, then um, making sure things are completely locked up and, and nothing is available and accessible. But some of it just by nature of the design of the seating becomes inaccessible at times when um, community users may be in there that may not understand the delicate nature of the equipment. Okay, thank you. Bruce, uh, just to add to the security, you know, what, what's included in the design for security, um, if I recall correctly, we have door contacts and keypad rough in for like your kind of standard punch in the code and de-arm the, the doors kind of system for the building. Um, but there was a pretty conscious decision, I think, not to install cameras around the community center. Um, Sammy may recall the conversations or not, but um, this, this would be going back a while. We, um, as well, there are dedicated closet and storage space for all of the computer equipment. So it's not like those are yeah, so for the, depending on whether it's the multi purpose or large multi purpose room, the offices, there are dedicated lockable spaces where that equipment is, is, is held. Any other questions from council? <clears throat> All right. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, moving on to item 3.2, uh, recommendation that the committee of the whole move to a closed meeting to discuss items pursuant to section uh, 90 paragraph 1 J and K of the community charter. Today, that information that is prohibited or information that, if it were presented in a document, would be prohibited from disclosure under section 21 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. And K negotiations related uh, and related discussions. Respecting the proposed provision of a municipal service uh, that are at their preliminary stages and that in the view of council could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality if they were held in public. Were of that recommendation, Councillor Fast, seconded by Councillor Morse. Uh, any objections? Do we have um, public questions at this point um, in the committee of the whole? I'm wondering if anybody else. Were there any public comments from the other lone member of the public uh, <laughs> in the audience? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine Geddy. So uh, moved and seconded. Uh, any objections? Motion carries unanimously to uh, move to a closed 